Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Webinar Wednesday by Smart Karma. I'm Michael Tegos. Today, we have a very special installment of our webinar, and I'm delighted to welcome uh, Mio Kato, Scott Foster, Shifara Samsudin, and Oshadi Kumar Siri from Lightstream Research. The team will present their unique views into uh, approaching the Japanese market, informed by their expertise on the ground, engaging with company management and bridging business and culture gaps between Japan and foreign investors. Before we start, uh, some very quick housekeeping. You can always uh, send in your questions for the team uh, using the Q&A button on your Zoom app. If you want to know uh, anything specific about the Japanese market, or if you have any questions about what they're going to talk to us about today. Uh, so just send in your questions uh, there. And please do not reshare or uh, reproduce the contents of this webinar without our express permission. You will find, as always, a recording uh, on the registration page afterwards. Uh, with that, team, uh, welcome. Thank you very much for being with us today. I will pass on the mic to you. Uh, please feel free to take it away. Thanks, Michael. Um, so yes, today we'd like to go through some of the premium services that we offer to help clients understand Japan better and potentially generate more alpha here. Um, so we'd like to discuss some of those services, but in addition to that, what we want to do is go through um, some of the results of the five conviction calls that we've had for 2021. And we thought we'd also share a few newer ideas, um, which are slightly off the beaten path um, to potentially help investors as we go into potentially a scenario where the market starts pricing in the start of tapering um, amongst various central banks. Um, in terms of the premium services that we offer, um, we actually offer three main services that could potentially help you. Um, so one is relatively standard in terms of helping with company visits or translation of meetings and essentially providing on the ground perspectives. And my colleague Scott will describe that in some detail as he has been doing this for a very significant amount of time and helping a lot of investors in the US, Europe, and also Asia with their Japan visits. Um, the second service that we offer is actually something like a rented junior service, um, where we can help clients with any information or data gathering, perhaps putting together peer comps tables, or any work that you would happen to want a junior analyst to do, but might not have a ready resource on hand at your fund. Um, so what we offer is essentially that on a time restricted basis, um, where we also offer a quality control layer, as well as um, Japanese English translation where it's necessary. Um, lastly, we do have some specialty in data and quantitative analytics. So we do offer client service in terms of examining companies earnings quality, um, forensic analysis, or looking at perhaps parts to profitability or even um, helping clients incorporate alternative data into their process. So some of the examples of insights that we generated here, for example, we highlighted that um, Douyu was actually massaging earnings going into its potential merger with Huya. And we think that helped them secure a higher um, share swap multiple, um, which eventually has come apart. Um, we also identified very early on that Mercury's long-term operating margin will probably be above 40%. Um, and we've also had significant success in terms of forecasting quarterly earnings for sectors like autos and gaming, where in a lot of cases we've identified where the sell side was off by more than 100%. Um, so those are some of the services that we offer, but I'll hand it over to Scott to describe some of the company visit type services that we can help you with? Okay, uh, well, first of all, <clears throat> Mio and I have uh, been in Japan for quite a long time and visited uh, many companies uh, and also uh, made uh, contacts by phone and other, other ways uh, with representatives of those companies uh, across a wide range of sectors. So uh, what we can help you with, uh, particularly now when you are unable to visit Japan, uh, is uh, to do that, uh, to do what we've done for years and years uh, in, the, in the Japanese time zone, uh, 
using Zoom and other uh, online conference technologies and the telephone and the email uh, in the Japanese language. We can contact any, any company, listed company that you would like us to contact. And then we can uh, arrange uh, and interpret internet-based conference calls. Uh, we can also uh, receive your questions uh, and if necessary, translate them into Japanese. If not, send them directly to the company and receive the answers. And if the answers come in Japanese, then we can translate them um, back to, to English uh, for you. Um, <clears throat> the uh, interpretation that we do uh, in the online conferences or actual visits when that becomes possible uh, is different from uh, the usual in that uh, we are experienced an analysts uh, with company and market knowledge. And that sounds like perfectly ordinary, except if you hire a professional uh, interpreter, you might not get that. And that means when you go into a meeting and the person on the other side of the table uh, is uh, not entirely clear or is hinting at things, uh, the direct uh, interpretation will not get to the nuances. Whereas people uh, who have uh, experience uh, talking to Japanese companies uh, should be able to pick those nuances up and uh, convey them to you. Uh, we have uh, covered a wide range of sectors, as I mentioned, uh, from factory automation to e-commerce, semiconductors to pharmaceuticals, uh, et cetera. Uh, and examples of uh, that being uh, the uh, factory automation uh, sensor maker Kients, the e-commerce company Monotaro, uh, semiconductor equipment maker Laser Tech, uh, drugstore Tsuruha, telecom equipment maker Anitsu, uh, the, uh, the, <coughs> the property technology, uh, online real estate technology company GA Tech, medical equipment, Sysmec, motor maker Nidec, and uh, Nihon m &A Center. So that, that basically covers the, the range of things that, that we can do for you, uh, pretty much uh, any, any sort of company that you want to talk to. Uh, we can also uh, provide uh, our views on Japan in the Asian and the global context. A uh, couple examples of that uh, with which you are probably familiar. Um, people learned uh, during the floods in uh, Thailand and during the earthquakes in Japan that uh, without Japanese equipment or materials, uh, there's a lot of things in other Asian countries that just cannot be built. Uh, semiconductors for starters, but many other things as well. And there are close relations between uh, Japanese suppliers and major Asian uh, companies such as TSMC. Uh, we can also talk about the market relevance of political developments. And right now, those would include the upcoming election, uh, what is going to happen to Prime Minister Suga, or whether or not that matters, uh, friction uh, with China and Korea, and the Taiwan question. And then finally, uh, depending on, on your needs and, and uh, wishes, uh, we can do uh, bespoke research, uh, written, spoken, however you would uh, like it to be done uh, to address your questions. So back to Mio. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, I think that summarizes what we can offer very well. Um, but in very general terms, I think it's just we're trying to help clients um, avoid getting lost in translation, essentially, um, simply because Japan's communication is difficult to understand at the best of times. And as Scott mentioned, in a lot of contexts, translators don't quite understand exactly what the company is trying to get across, or they're too um, literal in their translations, and that can lead to misunderstandings. Um, so that's something that we hope to help clients avoid, um, thanks to our experience in the market. Um, and I think Scott summarized those um, potential services well. Um, what we'd like to do next is start going through some ideas which hopefully clients have got some use out of so far and will continue to do in future. Um, to start off with, um, I'd like to invite Shifara to discuss a conviction call for 2021. Uh, thank you, Mio. So I will take you through free first. 
one of our conviction calls for 2021. Free offers cloud-based accounting and HR payroll software in Japan. And with the pandemic, the company started focusing on small and sole proprietorship businesses for customer growth. Free's underlying growth matrices have remained strong, as you can see from the ARPU and user growth chart, and the company plans to refocus on large and medium businesses going forward. As I said before, Free was one of our conviction calls for 2021. We made our conviction call on Free in November 2020, and we called for an upside potential of about 50% over the next 12 months. At the time of making our call, Free was trading at around 8,920 yen, and by mid-February, Free shares were up 43% already. This share price rally was partly led by the company's second quarter results that saw more than 50% buy-over growth in revenue and improvement in profitability. However, Free's share price started to come down a lot since its peak in February, and the company's shares are now almost flat since we made the conviction call. So what really happened? Free had a follow-on offering in March that really impacted the market sentiment. The main purpose of this offer was to fund the site visit acquisition and the market reacted negatively to this acquisition. Historically, Free was trading at higher multiples in anticipation of higher growth and the market was disappointed, and we think it reacted negatively as the company's margin improvement underperformed the market expectation, which led to a fall in multiples. At the same time, Mother's Index also had been weak during this time. Site Visit's core product, NinjaSign, is a full cloud-based contract management tool that targets small and medium businesses. NinjaSign highly complements free small and medium business strategy, and we think it is a good long-term bet. Though electronic contracting has not taken off in a similar way to overseas markets, we think it was a good decision by the company. As more and more people opt to work from home with the pandemic, it should also offer good momentum for e-contracting. Free also has mentioned that they will continue to spend on monetizing Ninja Sign and they will incur higher selling and marketing costs to onboard users that will again delay their profits. Looking forward, we are not too concerned as Free's core business continues to see strong top line growth and its profitability is also improving, though at a slightly lower rate. We regard Ninja Site positively and think Free's guidance for next fiscal year was too conservative. We think the market is being more myopic as it places too much weight on the company's profitability over the next few quarters. When you look at a company like Free, a combination of top line growth, margin improvement, as well as how intelligent the management is in executing their strategies should be looked upon rather than placing more weight on profits. Our continental analysis shows that free should be able to break even within the 24 months, within the next 24 months, supported by the strong top line growth of its core business. Mercari also had a similar case where the so pro slow progress of its US business dragged down market sentiment. However, as soon as results started coming through, the change in sentiment was large, which led to a significant rally in Mercury's multiples. In the case of Free, the upside is lower from the site visit acquisition as it was smaller and domestic compared to Mercury's US expansion. At the same time, the risk is also significantly less, and we expect the monetization of Ninja Sign to be faster and successful. We think the fall in free share price offers a good opportunity to buy the stock. And since the current valuation multiples are a lot more reasonable than when we initially made the call, we believe there could be even more upside than the 50% that we called for initially. Thank yeah. you. Would you like to move on to shift? Yes. So I will take you through a shift next. So what does shift do? Shift offers outsourced software quality assurance and testing solutions in Japan. 
the software testing market in Japan is estimated at around 6 trillion Japanese yen. However, only 1% of the market is currently outsourced. Whereas a majority of software testing is carried out by in-house engineers at software development companies. Shift is the market leader in the outsourced software testing market in Japan and their market share is estimated at about 70%. If you look at the outsourced software testing market, it can be categorized into three areas, enterprise, embedded and entertainment markets. Outsourcing is less common in the enterprise software market as it had long remained the exclusive domain of system integrators. But with labor shortage and other operational issues such as subcontracting, we have started to see the market shift towards outsourced solutions. Enterprise software testing requires advanced technological and development know-how which pose a significant barrier to entry. The business and testing requirements are also different for the enterprise segment. So under the enterprise business, Shift offers a full range of software quality assurance services, and they have started focusing on companies that have large IT investments, such as insurance and telecommunications industries that should help them build long-term relationships and help grow their top line. These projects also involve controlling the entire development process. As we have shown in the customer segmentation chart, the proportion of revenue shift earns from customers who contribute more than 700 million Japanese yen in annual revenues have continued to expand. As we mentioned earlier, the outlook for outsourced software testing market is highly attractive due to very low penetration. Our analysis shows that shifts margins have remained more stable without large fluctuations and the company's top line will continue to expand. If the current 1% outsourced penetration goes up to about 3 to 4% over the next four to five years, that itself will offer a large addressable market for shift. So moving on to shifts multiples, they have accelerated and seems expensive at around 80 times. However, we would note that the company's year end is 31st August, and once it takes over from one year to the other, its multiples also should drop by about one third, making it cheaper at around 54 times. Shift's revenues have seen steady growth over the past six to seven years, and there is no sign that the company's revenue growth is slowing down. They have grown at around 50% over the past four years, and the consensus forecast about 40% top-line growth over the next three to four years with stable margins. If you look at some of the high-growth stocks such as GMOPG, Monotaro, and M3, they are currently trading at about 60 times, 40 times, and 50 times respectively, and these stocks have consistently grown by about 20 to 30% annually, and their valuation multiples have continued to accelerate and still remain at very high levels. So, Shift's current multiples seem reasonable at, as it is growing at around 40 to 45%, and there is the historical precedent that it can get even more expensive. That's about it, Neo, from my side. Thanks, Shift. Um, yeah, so I think, um, as we discussed before, I think Shift is a very interesting idea. Um, of course, it looks extremely expensive, but as you noted, the um, year-end difference is one reason for that. And once it comes down to 55 times, um, the fact that it has such strong revenue growth prospects, um, the high market shares, the stable margins, um, and the extremely low penetration rate in terms of outsourcing makes this extremely attractive long-term. And the revenue growth also looks relatively assured. Um, so what I like about the name is actually that when you're growing at 40 or 45% a year, um, all it really has to do is maintain that 50 or 55 times multiple. And you're essentially compounding at that 40 to 45% revenue growth rate every year in terms of the share price, um, simply because the margins are so stable. So when the revenue growth outlook looks so stable and so bright, um, this looks like something that investors should definitely get to know. 
um, even though the high multiple may um, scare off some. Um, so in the current environment, just the overall robustness of the business model, I think, could attract investors and it could be a little bit less prone to some of the downside risks of companies which may be unprofitable or perhaps uh, much larger cap, but over Um So that's why we felt that Shift was actually quite an interesting company to highlight. Um, and moving on, uh, we will go to Oshi, who will discuss his 2021 conviction call. Thank you, Mio. So, okay, first up is the, uh, is the convenience store operator, 7 and I. And it's so its share price is already up 60% over the last 10 months. And we think there's potential to further 60% upside in the short term. We asked to buy 7 and I when its shares fell to 7 near low following the Speedway acquisition. We were positive on the Speedway acquisition when, uh, when the broader market uh, was kind of hesitant due to mainly due to its 21 billion price tag. Market reaction may have been caused by the fact that most uh, overseas Japanese MA activities end with huge write offs. But our deep understanding of Japanese companies and their management styles allowed us to predict, uh, allows us to predict the uh, success, uh, predict the M uh, overseas MA winners and losers rather accurately. And last year we predicted Mercury's success. And this year we think it's going to be 7 and 9. 7NI has a track record for successful MA in the US. Uh, around 50% of its US convenience stores were uh, acquired stores, and the company has proven it time and time again that it can uh, turn around underperforming convenience stores of competitor chains. The chart below is a good example. The merchandise revenue per store tend to go down upon acquisitions, but it comes back to the long-term growth trajectory in the following years. We estimated run, uh, estimated run rate synergies of around 650 million uh, through bridging the revenue per store grab, uh, gap and gross margin uh, uplift through changes in the revenue mix uh, for the Speedway acquisition. 7NI was a bit conservative when it first announced synergies of uh, $575 million per year, but later on they increased it by 10%. However, we think these synergies are still too light as it fails to account the scale benefits, lower transportation and operational costs due to increased market penetration. Furthermore, the full supply agreement with Marathon Petroleum, which they entered following the, uh, uh, the Speedway acquisition, could pro provide gross profit growth. So the synergies are likely to go up even more in the next few quarters. The long-term growth driver for 7NI is the industry consolidation. 7NI was already the market leader before the Speedway acquisition, and it has extended that lead through the acquisition of the third largest player in the market. The acquisition has also allowed 7NI to consolidate a significant portion of the convenience industry in the Midwest, East Coast, Northeast, and Southeast US. U.S. convenience store market is about 2.5 times the size of Japan and it is highly fragmented. The U.S. market is also getting to a point where it is difficult to add more and more new convenience stores. 7 and I kind of thrived in a similar situation in Japan and with compound average merchandise sales and operating profit growth of 5% and 9% in the U.S. over the last two decades, we think the company is on course to repeat its domestic success also in US. This could offer multiple returns over medium term. But on the short term, we think there's more upside left for 7 and I. Consensus EV, FI2, EV2 OP is still 26% below our estimate. Also, 7 and I has raised its medium term EV data target to 1 trillion uh, yen by 20, FI 2016. And the EPS is also expected to more than double over the next five years. At 7.7 .7 times FI2 consensus EV to OP, with uh, 7NI is not especially expensive, considering that it used to trade at around the median multiple of around 10 times during 2013 to 18. Shares have taken a break since, uh, taken a break, falling 9% since June 2021. But we think there's potential for 60% more upside through earnings upgrades and multiple expansion. <sighs> That's it for seven and nine Thanks. Okay. Uh, so the, our next call is Japan Tobacco. 
JD is also an interesting stock making a swift turnaround after a lengthy period of underperformance. The risk reward trade off seems particularly attractive. And with a healthy dividend yield of 6%, Japan Tobacco seems like an excellent option to manage the risk of weakness in the overall market. We have a few catalysts that could drive JD share price in the short term. The first one is the dividend uh, is a possible dividend hike. JD lowered its DPS by 15.6% in 2021 uh, due to uh, due to COVID-19 related business risk. However, the business hasn't been as bad as JD thought uh, it could be. Hence, they have revised uh, revenue, OP, and free cash flow guidance back back above the pre-COVID level. However, they left the DPS estimate unchanged and opened the possibility for a possible dividend hike in the second half of the year. JT currently has a dividend yield of around 6% and we think it could increase by, by another 120 basis points before the end of the year. Uh, JT, JT has continuously performed well in the overseas markets. Uh, while the overall industry, dec uh, industry volumes declined, JT's global flagship brands have had volume growth for more than five years, uh, or the, uh, more than five consecutive years. JD's market share in these key, uh, key geographies such as France, Italy, Spain, UK, Turkey uh, has uh, continuously gone up. Uh, however, the weakness in domestic market overshadows shadowed JT's success in, in the overseas markets. JT's domestic market weakness coincides with the launch of uh, ICOS. ICOS was a massive threat to JT's uh, domestic market dominance. Since the launch of ICOS in 2016, Japan Tobacco's domestic sales volume declined at an average rate of 9% compared to about 2.8% for the overall market. JT's response to ICOS was Plume. Uh, however, Plume was initially technologically inferior and, uh, as, uh, and uh, technologically as well as aesthetically inferior to ICOS. But recent upgrades have helped Bloom to be a worthy adversary to ICOS, and it has helped JT to stabilize its domestic market share at around 60%. Even though Bloom has not managed to retake market share from ICOS, its performance is still encouraging as it allowed JT to keep uh, all of its existing users without handing them over to ICOS. In addition, Bloom is also starting to contribute to OP growth with, uh, with uh, about 17.7 billion in incremental OP contributions during the last one and a half years. Meanwhile, the share price has dropped uh, by about 60% over the last six years due to weaknesses in the domestic market. But as of late, the selling pressure has faded and the shares broke, uh, the shares broke out of the long-term uh, declining trend. Investors like Sumitomo Mitsui Financial and Mitsubishi UFG, uh, UFG has already trimmed their positions last year. As domestic market stops weighing, uh, market performance stops weighing on the excellence overseas performance, yet is OP is expected to get back to the growth pace after declining at 8% for six year, for the last six years. We think this, uh, this could take the focus of investors away from the domestic market weakness and redirect it towards the excellent, excellent overseas business performance. Over time, we expect JT's dividend yield to fall by around two, 200 basis points to around 4%. As Plume proved that it, it is capable of taking the fight to ICOS, we think uh, for the downside to JD's valuation multiples are limited, especially considering that it's currently trading at fi 2 p of around 11 times. Meanwhile, a lot of central banks are talking about tapering and uh, if you're worried about the risk, we think JD could be an attractive op option to hedge it. Thank you. Thanks, Oshi. Yeah, so again, this is an idea that I liked and I thought should be on investors' radars simply because, as you mentioned, um, since there's talk of tapering, I think um, consumer staples and defensives such as Japan Tobacco should probably be considered. And um, one thing I really like that chart, um, the significant downtrend being broken out of and that helping valuations look quite cheap right now, plus um, as you mentioned, the fact that the domestic business is no longer a real drag. And when you combine that with decent growth for the global business, as well as um, a dividend hike, which could take yields up to quite attractive levels, um, where Japan Tobacco's dividend yield is now actually um, competitive with peers, whereas it used to be 
um, a real laggard 10 years ago. So this name again is something that we feel is um, probably not on every single investor's radar, not really a popular stock in Japan, but it definitely should be looked at. Um, so this is another name that we wanted to highlight. Um, moving on, um, I will quickly discuss some of um, my conviction calls for the year. Um, the first being Sony. Um, Sony actually performed very well initially. Um, similar to Free, it was actually up 30% going into February um, relative to when we made our call. Um, I wasn't expecting the company's guidance to be anywhere near as conservative as it was. And because of that, the market reacted quite negatively and um, the share price underperformed since then. Although more recently, it has started to um, pick up again as 1Q results has started to reassure the market that actually guidance was just conservative um, and the profit growth trend should actually not change. Um, most segments for the company have actually done well with the music business continuing to chug along and the semiconductor business also showing strong profits, even though Sony does need to replace some of the demand from Huawei um, with expanded sales to Apple. Um, one thing we would highlight in terms of our ability to identify potential surprises from deep data analysis is that we flagged as early as last year that the electronics businesses profit structure had improved significantly and that we um, felt that COVID was actually masking this and that was a potential for surprise thanks to Sony's move to 4K TVs and high-end um, earbuds as well as restructuring its mobile business. Um, in 1Q this came through in a big way and we think that caught the market off guard um, but if you knew how to look for it um, that was visible as early as last year. Um, Thinking about this year though, the real catalyst we feel over the next couple of quarters will be the gaming and pictures business. So the gaming business, if you look at the chart on the bottom left, um, what we highlight is the light green arrow, which shows the improvement from 4Q to 1Q in terms of the overall profitability where cost reductions for PS5 manufacturing appear to have benefited Sony significantly. They recently, reduced the size of the heat sink in the machine by about 25%. So cost reductions should continue to come through. And as the quarters go by, we expect the profit level of this segment to once again climb back over 100 billion yen, which should continue to boost sentiment. In addition, Sony delayed some of their key titles such as Horizon Forbidden West due to the slow PS5 production on account of the semiconductor shortages. Um, but Horizon Forbidden West has now been confirmed to launch in February. And as we get closer and more trailers are released, we think that anticipation will build for the game and sentiment on the gaming segment will turn increasingly positive. The other segment that we really like is the picture segment. Uh, we've been highlighting for years that Sony was actually trying to turn their Spider-Man IP into a mini um, MCU. And they seem to be succeeding with this. Um, trailers for the new Venom 2 movie, as well as Spider-Man No Way Home have been released. Um, both appear to be being received extremely well. And both also point to Sony actually having some success in terms of um, popularizing some of the villains from the Spider-Man universe um, to the extent that they can probably now release um, several movies a year. Um, based on this IP and therefore stabilized earnings, we think potentially over the next few years, maybe 100 billion yen per year um, in operating profit contribution from this segment uh, might be possible. And that again should be another positive for sentiment. Um, in terms of earnings, we think consensus is still probably about 20% too low. We think they underestimate profitability in the gaming segment, in semiconductors, um, as well as to a certain extent, possibly in pictures, um, certainly for the long term. At the same time, the multiple is about 16.7 times PE. This is lower than the historical median, which is just under 19 times. And given the strength of Sony's business and its leverage into the metaverse concept that we have flagged before, we think even 20 times is very reasonable. So we do expect the stock to once again rally um, and potentially break 15,000 yen, um, perhaps towards the end of this year or early next year. Uh, we remain extremely bullish on the name and this is probably our top um, pick in terms of a highly robust uh, potential law.
Um, moving on, um, a name which is slightly more speculative but has significantly more upside potential is Mazda. Mazda has already hit our 50% initial target for this year as a conviction call. Um, the main story here is volume growth in the US and also Australia. Uh, we've highlighted this in the chart on the bottom left. You can see exactly how rapidly North American volumes have increased for Mazda. Um, the reason for this has been that Mazda has been strengthening their sales network in the US over the last few years. This is something they've communicated, but that we think was underappreciated by the sales side. However, we've been in close contact with the company and being paying close attention to this. Um, so we saw the underlying improvements that were implied by these moves and therefore were able to flag this turnaround early. Um, what you can see is the stock is actually up 86% since the March 2020 bottom. Um, but despite this move, it's still only 0.5 times price to book. Um, as you can see from the chart, it's actually gone as high as three times. So that indicates exactly how much upside potential there is. Um, we do look very closely at what the underlying profit structure is. And even though consensus is projecting Mazda as a potential long-term 2% margin company, we actually think it's probably going to be something more like 5%. We even think 7% might be possible in very optimistic scenarios. So we think this still has a lot of upside potential and we expect this to be a multi-bagger over the next few years. Um, we'd also flag consensus is still neutral on the name. Um, they are behind the curve. Um, and this name carries a little bit more risk, but we do feel that there is very high alpha generation potential here. Um, moving on, um, Zozo is a last conviction fall name. Um, it's also up uh, more than 50%. Um, in this case though, that's not a good thing because we actually picked this as a conviction short. Um, the reason that it has outperformed our expectations so significantly is that the persistence of COVID has been significantly um, worse than we expected. And this has actually significantly boosted their shipments per member and also average purchase per shipment, um, which significantly impacts margins. At the same time, they benefited from their parent company Z Holdings being very aggressive with promotions for their PayPay -Pay mall. Um, but what we would note is that search data actually points to both Zozotown and PayPay -Pay mall seeing decelerating momentum throughout this year. And we feel that once the pandemic driven lockdowns um, ease, you will actually see a significant correction in the shipment momentum and also average purchase per shipment. And this will bring margins down very significantly and return the stock to a flat or even declining operating profit trend. So what we'd highlight here is that valuations have returned to being near peaks, despite the fact that earnings growth expectations are near all time lows. Um, previously, when earnings growth expectations declined significantly, the EV EBIT multiple actually declined towards 10 times and even below 10 times, almost down to six times. Um, right now it's trading closer to 22 times. So we actually picked this to have potentially 50% downside at the start of the year. Um, uh, Target price actually hasn't really changed. Um, we think that there's downside even towards 1,000 yen, whereas it's currently trading at 4,200 yen. Um, so this is a name that we have been completely wrong on, but we do think that the underlying conditions point to very significantly inflated expectations and that the market expecting Zozo to continue to grow at a high rate is actually incorrect. Um, so this is a mea culpa. And it is unfortunate, I guess, that almost all of our conviction names seem to go up about 50%, even when they are short goals. Um, but overall, um, we feel that the hit rate has been quite decent, given the performance numbers that we described before. Um, the last name I want to touch on is actually a small cap name. Um, so it's a company called Dover Holdings, which is a smelter, but also has significant environmental um, exposure. Um, I like the name because it's both an environmental play and an inflation play. Um, what I want to highlight here that is unique is that the company has a lot of exposure to PGM metals. 
um, platinum, palladium, and rhodium, um, which are used in automotive catalytic converters. And rhodium in particular has seen a surging um, price, which has helped this company post extremely high profits in the smelting segment. Um, if you take a look at the chart at the bottom left, we normally forecast their smelting segment profits using zinc prices, which is their biggest um, metal in terms of volume. But you can see how much it's been overshooting very recently, and this has been driven by the PGM metal prices. What we want to highlight here is that, firstly, the smelting segment profits are actually above their peaks from the 2007 years, which was super normal. But the other factor is that because of the switch to EVs, um, catalytic converter um, recycling capacity in terms of the materials for catalytic converters won't really be increasing. Dover essentially has a monopoly position within Japan and even globally, there aren't really plans to expand the capacity. Virgin metal is not the main driver for volumes here. So what you have is an extremely attractive um, cash cow business here where there's probably not going to be too much competition coming in because of the long-term prospects, but perhaps for 10 to 15 years, Dover can potentially earn really super normal profits here. There are some signs that um, the markets for these materials have become slightly frothy and that there's a lot of um, speculative investment activity going on and some of the prices have started to decline. But nevertheless, we expect prices to be extremely firm over the long term. And we would note that um, even at the price levels of last quarter, um, which were not exceptionally elevated, um, Dover could potentially generate about 40 billion yen in ordinary profit per year. And at that level for this segment, um, the company would probably be trading on something as low as 6.8 times PE. Um, so we think there's significant up upside on that basis. We would also flag that they actually are seeing extremely strong momentum in all of their other segments. Um, this is one of the typical Japanese companies that has a lot of very high market shares in niches, typically 40 to 80 percent. Um, a couple of those niches that we would highlight, one is silver powder, which is used in solar panels. And here they have over 50 percent market share for high-end panels. Um, and this obviously is going to grow very quickly thanks to the focus on renewables and solar. Um, another area where they have significant market share is for copper connectors that are used for electrical wiring in automobiles. So as you expand EV volumes and also autonomous driving, you're going to need more wiring and a lot more of these copper connectors, which are also a significant contributor to earnings. Um, lastly, we would highlight that they are one of the most sophisticated and technologically capable recycling companies in the world. Um, domestically, they're seeing very strong demand. They've also been expanding capacity for recycling as well as soil remediation and waste disposal um, throughout ASEAN. Um, right now, of course, ASEAN, a lot of countries are seeing lockdowns, but as these open up, we think you're going to see another leg up in terms of um, demand for this segment. So what you're seeing is a company with um, very strong momentum across all of its segments plus the supernormal profit contribution from PGM metals. And this is all available at just one times book and 10 times PE based on consensus, which doesn't factor in the extremely high profit levels of the PGM metals business. Um, this has gone towards two times price to book when conditions were positive as they are now. Um, so it is a small cap play, but we think that its thematic exposure is actually quite interesting, and um, there is very significant upside here, and the name is extremely cheap. So if you are concerned about various um, tapering scenarios, this is potentially a name that could rise even through such market headwinds. So this is again a name that we wanted to flag because it's probably not on most foreign investors' radar. Um, and that concludes our um, brief summaries of the ideas recapping our conviction calls, as well as three ideas that we hope are relatively unique and off the beaten path, which investors might want to take a look at given the evolving market conditions. Um, yes, so that wraps up our presentation. Um, if there are questions either on the ideas we've discussed or potentially on what you might be interested on in terms of 
the situation in Japan or how we might be able to help in Japan. We're happy to take those now. Thank you very much, Mio. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, team. As Mio said, um, if you have any questions you wish to share, uh, you can do that right now. Uh, or if not, uh, you can always email us at research at smartkarma.com. Um, and we will make sure to pass on any questions uh, to the team. Um, Mio, uh, I guess when it comes to sort of foreign investors approaching Japan, um, do you find that the larger conglomerates, the likes of Sony, for example, are easier to approach than the smaller cap ones? Or are the cultural differences too stark um, even in the case of multinationals? Um, so for multinationals, we actually think um, the cultural differences are not so extreme, but it can depend a lot on exactly who you speak to. Um, so in that sense, it's still kind of important to actually understand some of the nuances. Um, but as you mentioned, of course, when it comes to small caps or some of the um, less international names, um, the importance of having um, a real understanding of Japanese culture obviously increases very significantly. Um, and for investors who are looking at Japan and um, presumably given some of what's going on in China, um, for those investing across Asia, the weight of Japan may potentially increase simply because of its liquidity. And if you're trying to find higher growth names, um, there are definitely some large cap names um, like Sony or, for example, Kians um, and some of the semiconductor names, which do have attractive growth profiles. But in a lot of cases, these start to attract very high valuation multiples. Um, so that kind of defeats the purpose of one of Japan's main attractions, which is that it still offers significant value in pockets. Um, so if you're starting to go slightly lower down the market cap scale, um, we think that's an area where we could definitely help. And certainly Scott has been extremely active um, in terms of visiting these names um, with a lot of um, US and European investors in particular, given the uh, time difference. Um, so yeah, we think that, um, that cultural nuance uh, gets more important as you go towards these smaller companies. Um, it's not completely irrelevant even for larger names. Um, so that's definitely an area that we can help with if investors are interested. Thank you for that. Um, as we are uh, running a little bit uh, longer, um, maybe I'll close with um, a question on uh, the continuing kind of impact of uh, COVID-19 in Japan in particular. Uh, we have seen that, um, of course, it affected everything from the Olympics to um, now the uh, 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 I guess, the administrative level uh, in Japan. So do you think that your ideas, your picks uh, will be um, adversely impacted by a continuing crisis and potentially a change in uh, leadership? Um, in terms of the continuation of lockdowns, um, in most cases uh, on the long side, I'd say, it would be generally favorable. Um, Seven and I would probably um, have a slight negative impact, although it has done relatively well um, even through that. Um, as I mentioned, in terms of the Zozo short, if the lockdowns continue, um, that will continue to do well. So that name would continue to go against us. But at the same time, if lockdowns end, that would probably be where you can pick up a lot of downside in that name. Um, other names such as um, Shift have seen some mixed results in terms of um, the overall favorability to tech versus potentially seeing slightly um, slower growth when lockdowns were at their most severe. Um, but overall, um, it's not too negative. Um, Mazda is one potential name where there could be some significant risk. Um, if there are production shutdowns. Um, typically, investors overreact to these pro production shutdowns because they tend to last a lot 
um, the time period tends to be significantly shorter than it is actually priced in. And when things reopen, you usually get um, a surge in demand to catch up for lost time. Um, so that tends to be a trading opportunity, but there is certainly um, downside risk in the short term um, if you do see lockdowns. Um, in terms of the political risk, I think Scott might have a slightly better idea in terms of some of the potential impacts. Uh, but I think the general consensus is that it, the current potential changes in the LDP leadership, as well as the general election, um, unless the LDP actually were to lose, um, there's probably not a huge um, trade to put on there. Uh, but I'll let Scott discuss that. Yeah, well, I would I would agree with that. I think um, there's there's not going to be too much a fundamental change simply because the the opposition is is not credible. So uh, the voter turnout will probably go down. Uh, people are are not enthusiastic about the current prime minister, uh, but there's not much of a choice. And of course, it's a parliamentary system, so you're not voting for the president, you're voting for your local representative. And uh, I would guess that, the, uh, that there's not going to be a major shift in the, in the distribution of votes between the parties. Uh, Japanese do tend to punish governments that they don't like, uh, but not to the extent of overthrowing them unless things have become uh, so terribly bad that they can't stand it anymore. And that, that's quite rare. I, I don't think that's happening now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. And uh, thank you very much, team, for uh, this entire presentation today. I think this has been uh, very informative. Uh, and I hope everyone found it uh, valuable as a kind of peek into uh, the Japanese market and the kind of insight that Lightstream Research can offer. Um, if you wish to engage Lightstream for uh, bespoke uh, research services, please reach out to your Smart Karma account manager. They will uh, help get you set up. Uh, and as I mentioned before, if you have any other questions, please email us at research at smartkarma.com. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, thank you uh, Mio and team for your time today. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Goodbye everyone. <laughs>